This is Revelation 19, and we're finishing off Revelation 19 today, starting with verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, "'Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Another uplifting passage, right? <laughs> what is going on? Oh my goodness, if you just walked in every time we, we read something like this, my thought immediately goes to those of you guys that are here for the first time. You're like, what did I just walk into? Well, we are in the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, and it's apocalyptic literature, so it's metaphorical, it's imagery, it's symbols, a whole bunch of things going on. And the feeling, visitors, that you're having right now as you hear me read, they're eating the dead and gorging eyes out and all that. Listen, this is the feeling I had about a year and a half ago when I began studying this stuff, going, how in the world am I going to preach this? So open confession, open confession. When we started this idea, I knew the Lord wanted us to go through the book of Revelation. And so I open it up and I start reading it over and over again, all chapters, all 22 chapters, because I've read it before. I've had Youth pastors preach it. I've heard senior pastors try to preach it. I, I've heard this before, and it's never made sense to me, ever. And I, from what I've heard from many of you, same could be true in, in your walk and in your journey as well. And, and so the confession is, as I look at this, how do we make sense of it? To me, what the book of Revelation feels like when you first encounter it, it's kind of like this jigsaw puzzle where you don't know where to begin. You're like, if I can just get the corners and if I could get the edge in place, maybe I can figure out where all the other pieces fit in. And the issue is when this book was first written to the first century audience, it wasn't a jigsaw puzzle. They knew apocalyptic literature. They knew metaphor. They knew symbolism and numerology and all of this stuff. They knew how it played out. But our Western mindset has chiseled it all up and we've made it all these different things. We're like, I don't know where the mark of the beast fits or this dragon or this, this red woman or the seven churches. Where, how does this all fit together? Ladies and gentlemen, I, I was with you. I, I'm sitting there going, how do I, first, first of all, I can't teach it unless I understand it. So how do I understand it? So pieces started coming together right? Pieces that you guys are now familiar with, 666, not meaning I'm just going to get this tattoo on my forehead, but th this metaphorical, hey, 666 is one less than 777. It's completely incomplete. It's inferior to our God, to Jesus, the, the Antichrist, this dragon, this devil, Satan of ours. He, or he is trying to emulate Jesus every nook and cranny. This is what he is doing. But here's what happens, and I think you guys have noticed this. Maybe you haven't put words to it, but the more time we spend in the book of Revelation, you realize that there is a framework. And once you understand that there is a framework, we can start putting the pieces together. We don't have these random pieces of here's the mark of the beast and here's this woman on a dragon. What do I do with all of this? What's the framework? The backbone, the spine of this entire book is this understanding that things are not as they seem. So we look out at our world, we look out at culture, and there's chaos, and there's evil, and there's wickedness, the stuff going on in Israel, the stuff going on in our backyard, and we're like, has God lost control? Has God abdicated his throne? And revelation, again, this word re revelation means to pull back the curtain so that we can see what is actually true. 
So we see stuff and we think stuff is going on, but God pulls back the curtain in this beautiful book and says, this is what's actually happening. God is actually winning in all this. Everything that is taking place in our world, fear not, Christian, I have overcome the world and I'm asking you to be patient, endure, because you too will be invited to ultimately be the ultimate overcomers. I'm, I haven't abdicated my throne. So there's this, this theme, this thread that's going through the entire book that says, hey, God is still in control. Things are not as they seem. When you see stuff, just know that there's a bigger truth out there than you can see. And then the question for us as followers of Jesus quickly becomes, which way are you going to land? Are you going to choose to compromise your life and follow the way of the dragon, the manipulative ways of the dragon, Satan himself, or are you gonna to choose to follow the faithfulness of Jesus Christ? That's your only choice. You're either gonna follow the way of the dragon or you're gonna follow the way of the lamb. Which one are you going to choose? This is what Revelation is all about. Now, for those of you guys that love literary agency, the way, the manner in which the book is written also has its edges as in a puzzle. There's a way it's written, and, and we've talked about this slightly. I probably should have spent more time in this over the, the course of the year talking about how it's written, but it's written in the form of five windows where John is invited to look and see on five different occasions what is going on. Remember this, it's really important. When we read the book of Revelation, one of the reasons we trip over it is because it's not written in a Western style. Like if we were going to a class, if we were in a Bible class, whether maybe a Sunday school or maybe it's a seminary class or maybe it's a university class, whatever, you're used to your textbook, like Western Civ going, hey, in 1800, this happened. In 1802, this happened. In 1837, this happened. In 1880, this happened. In 1917, this happened. It's chronological. So in the book of Revelation, we come to this place and it's not chronological at all. We go to this, from the letters to the seven churches. We're welcomed into the throne room of God. All of a sudden, we're at the birth narrative of Jesus, and then we're in the future in eternal heaven. It's all over the place because the book of Revelation was given to John, and, and I think we kind of understand the way we read. We're like, okay, what happens next? This happened, now what happens after this? So window one should be the thing that happens first, window two happens second, window three, four, and five, and it's in chronological order, but that's not the way Revelation is played out because apocalyptic literature wasn't written that way. It's all over the place. So Jesus is revealing to John not what happens next, and John is writing not what happens next. John is writing what is revealed to him next, what he sees Next, in these five windows, over and over again, Jesus is inviting John, and then John is inviting us to look and see. This was one of the series we covered at the very beginning of this. It was called Look and See, because Jesus is going, John, look, behold, check this out. And then John turns around and he says to us, hey guys, check this out, look at this. So these are the five windows. You've got them in your notebooks that are on your um, chair this morning. So there's five different windows, and I'm not gonna spend a, in, hardly any time in these. Window number one was just this introductory window of who Jesus is, and then these seven churches. We get an idea of Jesus's love for his church. In window number two, a door is opened into heaven. This was my favorite window of all the windows that we've opened. Window number two was my favorite one. John is welcomed into the throne room of heaven, he sees what's going on, 24 elders, four living creatures, myriads and myriads of angels, all this activity going on there. And he invites us to witness it. So he's like, hey, listen, God hasn't abdicated his throne. He's in charge. See what's actually going on. Window number three is where it started getting weird, right? It's like two thirds of the way through and we're like, okay, what's happening? All of a sudden we have this war going on. We've got the wrath of God. We've got these seven, um, the, the seven scrolls or the seven seals of the scroll are open, the seven trumpets. We've got this woman and this dragon going after the child of the woman and the dragon and the beast. And we've unpacked all of that, right? So that was window number three. Window number four is what we just got out of, which are the seven bowls, the final judgment of God and now in this series, we're ending, we're landing the plane with the fifth window where heaven itself is opened. And everything revolves around this one Greek word. And you're gonna, I, I hope you fall in love with this word. Caden is in his first semester of Greek. I tested him the other day. He's already been introduced to this word. He knew it. I'm like, huh. took me nine semesters to figure out this word. And he got it in six weeks. So cool, awesome. Pregnancy brain, remember? Just, it's contagious. Um, so he, here, here's the word. We're gonna be introduced to this word in Revelation 19. You've already been introduced to it, but we haven't talked about it. It's the word adieu. In English, it's I-D-O-U, I-D-O-U. And all it means 
It's, a, it's an imperative. We've talked about imperatives over the course of the last few weeks with the word hallelujah. An imperative is a command. It, it's do this. I'm not suggesting this. Do this. And so when we see this word do, it means behold, look. Drop everything you're doing. Whatever it is that you've got your hands on right now, drop it and pay attention to this. And we're gonna see this in a number of places today because in the fifth window, this word is absolutely key. As we walk through the book of Revelation, I don't know why it took me so long to notice this, but as we walk through the book of Revelation, I think this word is the key word. We look through the book and and the key words are not witness, go, go witness, overcome, be persevering. It's not be discipled. It's not even love. The key word in this entire text, chapters one through 22, is behold, look. Jesus is showing John something, and John sees it in his command to us. So Jesus tells John, behold, it do, look. John turns around, he's like, hey, reader, drop everything you are doing. Behold and look. John's like, everything I see right now, if you see what I see, right? It it sounds like a Christmas song. Do you see what I see? If you see what I see, said John to the shepherd boy, if you see what I see, you will go, you will witness, you will worship, you will love. Behold, look. So this is where it all starts. And it starts, let's go back in our text that I just read. We're not gonna read all the text again, but we're gonna start back at the beginning. Revelation 19, 11. Check this out. Check how it starts. Then I saw heaven opened. So he's already been in the throne room, but something's different this time. In the fifth window, John sees heaven. This eternal state that those that are in Christ Jesus will spend their very last, like the rest of their lives, eternal life. I see it. I hear, I see it open. I saw heaven, comma, and ado. Behold, look, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. So I see heaven open. And when heaven is open, I see two things. Did you notice the two things he sees? First of all, he sees a white horse. And then he sees a person sitting on that white horse. This is really, really, really important. Because in the first four windows, when he sees something, oftentimes he is seeing something. God reveals something to him and he sees something. The fifth window is open. Heaven itself is open. What's he going to see the first time he gets to look into heaven? Pearly gates, streets of gold, Every joke you've ever been told, Peter's up there telling jokes to every kind of person that's gonna show up. What what do you see when heaven is open? He doesn't see a thing. He sees a someone. He sees a person standing there. And who is that person? This isn't a trick question. Who is the person he sees? It's Jesus. Now, here's what we don't see that the first century reader would have seen. It's because we've made Revelation weird and, and listen, we're not Bible scholars. I, I, I couldn't connect the dots on this without a whole bunch of help, okay? So there's something going on here in this text that we would never see unless somebody helped us connect the dots. Who's writing the book of Revelation? Don't say Jesus. Who is Jesus working through? John, okay, the apostle John. Who wrote the gospel of John? Again, not a trick question. John, okay? So we got it. We're, we're all on the same page. The same person wrote the gospel of John, and the book of Revelation, right? So in the book of Revelation, here in chapter 20, verse 11, he's like, behold, look, and I, I, heaven is open, and as soon as I see heaven open, I see a person. Those that were really, really familiar with what was going on in Jesus's life and ministry would connect the dots. There's something to connect. Let me show you, because it's really, really cool. Go back with me in your minds, all the way back to Jesus's beginning of his ministry, Actually, go farther back with me. Before Jesus starts his ministry, who is the way maker? Who's the one preparing the way for Jesus? His cousin, John the Baptist. Not the same John who wrote the book. Many Johns, okay? So this is a different John. John the Baptist, Jesus's cousin, is out there calling people to repentance and baptism. And one day he's out there doing his gig, doing what he does, and Jesus shows up. And this is what John says. John chapter one, verse 29. So John the apostle is recording the words of John the Baptist. Two different guys. John 1, the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Edu, behold, drop everything you've got going on, and look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin 
of the world. And all of a sudden, Jesus' ministry starts getting launched. Right there, what happens, it's kind of cool. I don't know if you guys know this, but John had disciples. Okay, in this day, these teachers, these rabbis would have disciples. John has his own disciples. One of his disciples is a guy named Andrew. Andrew has been working with John the Baptist, and John the Baptist's entire ministry revolves around pointing people to the one who is going to come, Jesus. So all of a sudden, John's like, hey, here he is, the one who fulfills my ministry. If I'm John the Baptist, I'm sitting there going, okay, now that he's here, what's my job, right? Successful. Here he is. My whole job, my whole life points to this moment. Here he is. Andrew, one of John the Baptist's disciples, sees Jesus. He's like, hey, John, I'd like to transfer membership. I know I'm your disciple, but our whole ministry has been about this guy. And now that he's here, I need to switch churches, right? I need to switch allegiances. He doesn't just bounce. He probably had a conversation. I'm sure John wrote him a nice letter. Jesus accepted his membership and his request to leave this over here. And so he left from here to here and he follows Jesus. Now, the significance of this, first of all, Andrew is now a disciple of Jesus. Awesome. But for us in the flesh, there's something bigger going on. Andrew has a brother, and Andrew recruits his brother to become a disciple of Jesus. Anybody know who Andrew's brother is? It's Peter, okay? So now Peter becomes a disciple of Jesus as well. The very next day, Jesus is recruiting more disciples. He's got to get to 12. So the next day, he invites a guy named Philip to join him. Now, Philip has a friend named Nathaniel. I want to talk to you about Nathaniel for a minute. Can we call him Nate Dog? Are you guys cool if we call him Nate Dog? Because our own Nathaniel, who's up here on the keyboards, that's what I call him. He's Nate Dog, okay? He's not just Nathaniel. And have you ever noticed how hard and difficult that name is to spell? Like, depending on who it is, is there an I? Is there an A-E? Like, so we're going to Nate Dog and D-A-W-G, Nate Dog. That's what we're going with. So our boy Philip is now following Jesus, and he goes to his friend Nathaniel and tells Nathaniel about Jesus. But Nathaniel is skeptical. Nathaniel is that friend we all have, who is blunt, who just says it like it is. So what happens is Philip goes to Nathaniel and says, hey, I think the Messiah is here. Andrew left John the Baptist to go follow him. Peter, the loudmouth, he's following him. I'm definitely following him. You should follow him too. And Nathaniel's like, where's he from? Philip says, well, he's from Nazareth. Do you remember how Nate Dogg responds to that statement when he finds out that Jesus is from Nazareth? In John 1.46, his response is, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's, that, that, that's rude. That is really, really rude. And it made me think. I'm sitting in my office writing this. It made me think, okay, Nazareth, what kind of town must this have been? Really vanilla, really boring. you know, Or, or it's just got this history in, in the Israel nation. Not good. Can anything good? I, I understand Bethlehem. I understand Jerusalem. But Nazareth? Really? Nazareth? So I thought to myself, I'm like, okay, let's just pretend that it was boring. Like, damn, nothing exciting. And that's not what it implied. But what if it was just a boring, sleepy town? What would it be equivalent to if Jesus came from a city in Central Florida, a, a location specific in Central Florida? So I Googled it. With Google, you can find anything, folks. I don't know if you're familiar with this Google thing, but you should try it. It's pretty cool. And so I Googled the most boring cities in Central Florida, <laughs> I, as I wanted, I wanted to find out. I live in one, y'all. Like, I'm about to turn 50 years old, and I bring the median age down in Longwood, okay? So I live in Longwood. I'm like... Longwood, it took a long time for us to even get our, 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 the median of 434 mowed, let alone put flowers in it. I mean, it, it's Longwood. So I, I was sure Longwood would be in there, okay? It wasn't. We didn't make the top three. In 2014, the Orlando Sentinel did an article about the top 10 boring, most boring cities in Orlando. That, that's my question. Why? Why would you do that? Like, what kind of writer is sitting at his desk going, I... You, this is what we're going to write. I mean, seriously, dude, something's got to be happening in our city better than this. So I looked. Um, I'm not going to go through the top 10, but here's the top three most boring cities in 2014, and I think it's changed. In 2014, these were the three uh, most boring cities in Central Florida. Number one was Point Siena. Number two is Palm Bay. Number three was Apopka. How? Apopka's exciting. There's like a shooting there every other day. How can that? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 
I'm kidding. I, but I, it, it didn't make sense. To, like, first of all, I have no clue where Palm Bay is. Point Siena is over by the Kissimmee area, right? So, I mean, you got Disney, you got whatever. So those are the most boring cities. You can take that down. But I just wanted to make a point. This is what's going on. Philip says he's from Nazareth. Nate Dogg's like, does anything good come from Nazareth? What was Philip's response? Adieu. Adieu. Come and see. Come and look for yourself. I don't know how to explain it, but when you're in this guy's presence, you will experience it for himself. So he's coming and seeing Nate is Nate Dog's over there eating figs one day. Jesus sees him over there eating figs. Nate Dog is impressed that Jesus has seen him. There, there's some weird stuff going on where Jesus is either reading Nate Dog's mind or he just has some insight into our boy Nathaniel. All of this stuff happens. Nathaniel starts walking at Jesus. He's wondering, does Jesus know? that I kind of made fun of his hometown. You make fun of my hometown, I'm either going to agree with you and enjoy the jokes together, or I'm going to get offended. There's no gray area in this, right? So what's Jesus's response going to be to Nathaniel who said, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus's response to Nathaniel as he's walking towards him is this in verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him and said to him, Edu, behold, look, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Jesus is commending this boy for saying it like it is. Well done, Nate Dog. And I think that's pretty cool first impression you've left on the son of God. So Jesus had seen some things, all of this. Nathaniel's really impressed. How did you know this about me and all of this cool stuff? And Jesus is like, why are you so impressed, man? And he says this, this is the text I want you to notice. Remember, Revelation 1, I saw heaven opened and there was a person on a white horse. Rewind with me to John chapter one where Nate Dogg is talking to Jesus. Jesus answered Nathanael, because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, that's what makes you believe? You will see greater things than these. And Nathanael's probably like, what are we going to see? And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So really what's going on is this is a prophecy being given to Nathanael that one day, not only Nathanael, but all Christians, those that John invites and Jesus invites to tear open the curtain of heaven and you're going to see into heaven. So in 96 AD on the island of Patmos, John is inviting us 2,000 years later, 1,900 years later, saying, drop everything, guys. Behold, adieu, the fulfilled prophecy that was given to Nathaniel. And I wrote down 100 years ago or 60 years ago is being fulfilled right now. He's pulling back heaven. When he pulls back the curtains of heaven, what do we see? We see Jesus. We see a person. Now, here, here's where we're gonna, we're gonna start transitioning. This, is, this text, as confusing as this text is, if we can frame it, it's a beautiful text. It's such a life-giving text because we see a person and what's this person on? He's on a horse. What color is the horse? You caught this, right? It's a white horse. So Jesus is riding on a white horse. Now, those of you guys that have been with us all year long, you remember when we were in Revelation 6, When the seals of the scroll were being opened, we were introduced to the four horsemen, the first four seals that were opened, the first four wraths of God played out. What was the first seal? It was a man, a rider, riding on a white horse. And most of us that have grown up trying to understand Revelation just assumed in Revelation chapter six, the first rider on a white horse has to be Jesus. Anytime somebody's riding on a white horse, it's gotta be Jesus, right? And we kind of burst that bubble. These four horsemen were not good dudes. They came to create chaos and war. The one riding on the back of this white horse was wearing a wreath, not a crown. We'll get to that in a minute. And there were subtleties that gave it away or clues that gave it away that this was actually the Antichrist. This was not Jesus himself. So this rider in chapter 20 is not the one that we saw in chapter six. That was a pretend Christ-like figure. Now in chapter 19, at the end, the one riding on the white horse is absolutely Jesus. It says he's the word of truth. This is who he is. He's not a pretend one. Now in this day and age, when a king would come riding into town on an animal, it indicated what was about to happen. If he was riding in on a horse, they were about to go to war. 
Okay, so this is why the Antichrist, this white horse, the horseman, he was coming to go, he was coming to make war. Now in chapter 19, Jesus is on the back of a horse. He's ready to go to war. If he was coming into town riding on the back of a donkey, he was coming to bring peace. Horse equals war, donkey equals peace. Some of you guys are starting to put some pieces together, some Easter pieces together. Go with me to the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter nine. He prophesied this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, O Jerusalem, Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, adieu, look. Your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? What is he prophesying in Zechariah? The triumphal entry of Jesus's entry into Jerusalem where he comes in on a donkey. Jesus comes in on a donkey, not to make war, but to make peace. Zechariah, in that moment, is proclaiming that the Messiah would one day defeat the enemy's war horse through an act of peace, which makes no sense. But now in Revelation 19, Jesus is no longer on a donkey. He's on a horse because he's riding to war. Now, let me be straight up real with you, and this is the stuff. Hopefully, this will make sense to you. Um, This is me. I already confessed when I started Revelation. I had no idea what to do with it. Here's a bigger confession. I struggle with this idea of what we have been taught in the book of Revelation, that once you get to chapter 19, Jesus is gonna come in on a horse and we're gonna follow behind him and we are going to war. There's a final battle coming. I'm like, okay, cool. Jesus is gonna go kick the snot out of Satan once and for all and it will be done and then we'll go to heaven and live with him eternally. I've got a problem with that. Do you? Here's my problem. On the cross... Jesus said a really important phrase. He's dying. Everything is done. The the, the spear's about, well, he hasn't died yet, so the spear hasn't gone into him. He's been arrested, he's been accused, he's been mocked. The sins of the world are on him. His father has rejected, his father's turned his back on him. And Jesus says the Greek word, tetelestai. To me, it's it's the best Greek word there is, tetelestai. Anybody know what that means? It's three words. It is finished. So if Jesus says at the cross, it is finished, I have defeated Satan once and for all, either he meant it or he didn't. And Jesus isn't a liar. And this isn't metaphorical, this isn't symbolic, this is literal. Jesus said in this moment on the cross, the debt has been paid, I have crushed Satan. It's why in the book of Revelation, Satan can no longer touch Jesus. He can only go after us because Jesus finished the work on the cross. So we get to Revelation 19, And all of a sudden, we're like, hey, there's one more battle to fight. I'm like, what? And then once we fight that battle, are we going to be told there's another one after that? And I'm like, it's either finished or it's not. To tell us die either means it is finished or it's kind of sort of finished. And, And there's a little bit more work to do. The cross in that moment would be insufficient. I've got a problem with that. So either Jesus didn't really mean it is finished or we're misunderstanding Revelation 19 completely where one day there's gonna be one more war and Jesus is gonna lead us out into battle and we're gonna be behind him dressed in white. We're gonna go after the devil and kick the snot out of him or or something else is at play here. What's going on? Either Jesus totally, completely finished the work of salvation on the cross and defeated Satan, or he didn't accomplish anything at all. So why do we read in Revelation 19 that we're going to go to battle again? What is Jesus fighting if the war has already been won on the cross? Here's what I think is going on. Here's what I think is going on. I don't think Jesus, again, we're in the already but not yet. His kingdom has been inaugurated at the cross. It will be consummated in his final return. In his final return, when he's riding on this white horse and we are behind him, he is going into a war against Satan, against the beast, against the false prophets, against all of these people we've been we've seen, against his enemies, the human enemy, all of them, the demons, all of them. We're going up against him, and when he shows up for that war, he cashes in his ticket. The war has already been fought. 
This is him redeeming what he purchased on the cross. No more fight, no more war. Maybe the, the devil knows better. The ne- devil knows what's going on, but they're acting like they're going to war. Jesus comes in and he shows up and there's no war to be fought. The war has already been fought. He reminds them and they just drop. Everything is done because Jesus is one. This is what Paul is talking about in Colossians 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your heart or of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross once and for all. In that moment, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing completely, is what this means, triumphing completely over them. What Jesus is doing here in chapter 19 is coming to lock up the enemies of God, the beast of the sea, the beast of the earth, and then in chapter, what happens in chapter 19, you read through it, you can read the end of chapter 19. He throws the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth into an eternal hell, eternal hell. Chapter 20, when we get there, who joins them? The dragon, Satan himself. So they're there. And then after the final judgment, those that aren't in Christ join them for eternity in this lake of fire. And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks, but there's not a battle to be fought. Instead, Jesus has shown up on the scene on the back of a white horse, cashing in on the victory that he has already won. We're in the already but not yet. In that moment, in that moment, Jesus redeems everything. Now, how do we know that? That seems like a pretty dangerous assumption to make. Well, look at our text again, and I'm going to read it. I forgot what I sent the graphics team. I'm gonna read this text, and I was gonna say, listen, see if you can catch the clue. That, that makes sense of everything that I just said. W- what makes us know that there's no more war, that there's not a war to be fought? Well, the clue is going to be the text that is the clue is written in red, okay? So you, it's gonna be pretty obvious. So check this out. Starting with verse 11, I saw heaven opened and a dew, behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. So this is Jesus. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, going back to Revelation 1, connecting the dots there. And on his head are what? Many diadem, royal crowns, not a wreath made of flowers and plants like the one in Revelation 6, but king of kings kind of diadems. And he has a name written that no one but himself knows. Verse 13, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called as the word of God. So in all of this, this is who, I, curtain of heaven pulled back. There's a person riding on a white horse. It's Jesus. And it looks like he's going to war, but Rob's up here saying that there's not a war to be fought because the war has already been fought. How does Rob know this? Because of this sentence, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Ladies and gentlemen, think about it. Just be logical for a minute. If you are going into battle wearing a diadem, in royal, white, pure linen clothing. You're going into battle, not coming from battle. Going into battle, and your clothes are already soaked in blood. Where did that blood come from? Whose blood is on your linen clothes? You're going into battle, and you're already bleeding? What's going on? Did you just come from a battle? Is this your enemy's blood that's all over you? Is this one of your soldiers' blood that you're comforting and their blood got all over you? What's going on with this blood? His clothing is is dripping with blood all over his robe. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Whose blood is on Jesus's robe? A conquering king going into battle would kill his enemies and the blood would be all over him. Now, from the entirety of the book of Revelation and everything we know about the New Testament, there is only one answer to this question, isn't there? Whose blood is on Jesus' pure robe? His own blood. It's not his enemies. It's not his best friend. It's not your blood. It's his blood. Jesus' robe is both a priestly and a kingly robe, and it's stained with his own blood. It's the beauty of the right-side-up kingdom. It doesn't make any sense. Other kings conquer and win by defeating and killing and getting the blood of their enemies all over them. Our king says, I will lay down my life and pay the price 
for them. It's my blood. I'm coming in. The thing that I can declare victory about in this final battle is here's my robe. Here's my blood. Here's my blood. This is what's going on here. We may not know yet everything about Jesus, but we do know that Jesus won the battle over sin and death and hell and the demons and the Satan and the beast, not by killing everybody, but by sacrificing his own innocent life. Jesus won the victory over sin and death when he shed his own blood on the cross. In that very moment, the victory was won and his ticket for this victory, he was now cashing in, which would ultimately send the dragon and the beast and all of his minions to the pit of hell to tell us die. He really meant it, folks. It is finished. So we can continue. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. In Revelation 19, he says this, he said, we will, in verse 15, he says, we will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. This is an interesting text because if you read, we, the version of the Bible we use here at Orlando North is the English standard, ver, standard version. It's very close to the original Hebrew and Greek. The New American Standard is probably the closest. The ESV, it allows us to feel what's closest or read what's closest and still make sense, okay? So it's translatable. Um, and they do a pretty good job, but here they butchered it. They absolutely butchered it. It says here, Jesus will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. What this means is one day Jesus will incur the wrath of God, okay? So he will tread the winepress, crush the grapes. He, he will in the future tread the winepress. The problem is that's not what this word is. The Greek word is the Greek word pate. Okay, anybody, are any of you guys, those gross people like my dad, you go to a fancy grocery store and you order like liver pate, right? It's just disgusting. My dad owned a meat market and we sold liver pate and the only people that bought it were rich people. And I'm like, this is like poor man's food. This is worse than bologna. This is gross. It's crushed beef. It's, it's disgusting. So when I think of pate, this is where it's coming. Pate literally means to trample, to stop down, or to crush. No problem with the definition. But the way that the ESV interprets pate is at a, as a future active indicative. One day he will crush the wine press or he will be tread the wine press. One day he will be crushed with the wrath of God. In the Greek, it is not a future active indicative. It's a present active indicative. It's happened. It is happening. It will continue to happen. His crushing, his wrath is on him. God's wrath is on Jesus. His blood that is on his robe is complete and total. It's not something that will happen. It's something that has already happened and is covering every sin that you and I will ever have currently right now. Remember back in Revelation 14, I'm not gonna go into this. In Revelation 14, we're talking about, hey, when God's wrath comes out, it's gonna produce so much blood that it's gonna cover the entire area of Palestine. And we find out that this is representation of Jesus's blood covering everybody's sin, everybody that's willing to accept and receive his sin. Now, here's what's interesting. So we know the battle is finished. Jesus is one day going to walk into this battle. Well, not walk in, ride in, kingly, on a white stallion with a diadem on, with white priestly robes covered in blood, that blood being the ticket. So, hey, Satan, you've lost. I've won. Literally go to hell. The lake of fire is yours eternally. You're done once and for all. I'm casting you and your beast and your minions and anyone who's not with me into an eternal hell. And were you paying attention because you were in this story? Did you see it? Those of us that call Jesus Lord and Savior, we were in this story, verse 14, and the armies of heaven, that's us. We're now soldiers in heaven. We were arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, and we were also following him on white horses. Heaven is torn open. There's a person, crown on his head, dressed in white, soaked in blood, his own, leading us into a battle that he's already won, and there we are behind him, riding our own white horses as kings and priests of the kingdom. We are a royal nation, or a holy nation, a royal priesthood, made pure and clean by him. Now, did we have blood on our linens? No, because our blood is insuffice. It doesn't, it doesn't do the trick. It's his blood. But we are arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, following behind our king. 
if there was a battle to be fought, if we were going into this massive cosmic battle, we would be wearing soldiers' uniforms, but we weren't. We were wearing linens, which was the uniform of priests and the uniform of the bride. This is who we are. And we're following our king, our husband, into eternal life. Let me read this and I'll be, be done. The one command John gives us entering this text is look and behold. Get your eyes on what I am about to show you. A proper view of this shapes everything else in your life. What I'm showing you, what I want you to look at, is our king. Get your eyes off yourself. He's no longer coming into town riding on a donkey. Instead, he's now riding on a white stallion, a war horse. Pay close attention to his garments. Behold, adieu, look. They're covered in blood, his blood. And there you are, my fellow Christian brother and sister, and the armies following him. Now notice what you're wearing, pure, spotless, white linen robes. You have been purchased by God through the blood of his son. And not only did he purchase you from sin and death, but he made you both his priest and his bride. This is our king. This is what we're serving. And I think this all connects, the, the entirety of today connects. It, it, we go back to Romans 7 and 8 and our sin. And if it's up to us, our sin has just made a mess of our lives. We are not worthy. We can't win any kind of spiritual battle. The guy on the other side of the field has destroyed us. But our king comes in and says, I got you. I got you. Look to the cross because what I accomplished on the cross was more than sufficient for you. My blood will cover you forever and ever. Your wickedness, yeah, it's a mess. But where sin abounded, grace all the more. About my blood is bigger and thicker than anything you could ever do. That's our king. Those are the robes you wear today, if you're his. If you're not his, you're not there yet. If you haven't submit, submitted and surrendered to the lordship of King Jesus by faith, then you're on the other side. And your destiny is where the dragon and the beast will one day go unless you switch allegiances. Say, man, I surrender to the lordship of King Jesus, the one who gave his life for me, the one who loved me enough to shed his own blood for my sin, that every sin, every wretched sin that I've ever done, every sin that I have and will ever have is covered by that blood. I submit, I cry uncle to him. Forgive me of my sin. I repent, I come to you, King Jesus. I switch allegiances, you're my king. That could be you today. That's the offer of scripture. That's the offer of the gospel. That's the, the, the offer of your king today. Will you bow a knee to King Jesus? Will you bow your heads with me? Let me pray. Jesus, I pray that these words in Revelation 19 would spark a devotion in our heart like we've never had before. God, every time we hear this story of the gospel, may it just ring true. May it become more familiar, more real, more alive to us every time we hear what you have done. May we grasp and understand the weight of our own sin, the depravity of our own sin, what, what condition we're found in apart from you so that when we run into your grace and when we run into the story of what you have done for us, it will bring rejoicing in our heart. It will bring humility. It will bring obedience. So King Jesus, we come to you today. We thank you for your blood that has purchased our redemption, the blood that has saved us and set us free from the law of sin and death. We no longer are getting what we deserve, but we're getting your righteousness. We're getting eternal life with you because of you. Nothing we could do, it's just you. So with that, we praise you. With that, we, we cry a hallelujah, praise be to God. We understand that your mercy is more than all of our sin combined. And with that, we give you all praise. We love you, it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Will you stand and sing this song one more time?